Well, if you would take your Bibles this morning and turn with me in the book of Psalms. We're in Psalm 104 this morning. If you're wondering, how far are we going to go? Well, there are 150, but we're going to stop at 106 for at least a little while. But we're at Psalm 104 this morning, so turn there with me again. If you don't happen to have your Bible with you, there should be one next to the hymn books there. Please feel free to use that this morning as we look at God's Word together. We're going to be talking about celebrating the Lord, celebrating specifically God, our Creator. You know, most people, I believe, enjoy celebrations, you know, birthday parties, anniversaries, holidays like today. Summertime, it seems like every nice day offers the opportunity or at least gives us an excuse to get together and celebrate, doesn't it? The weather's nice, you want barbecue, even when the weather's not nice. Get together and have a crab feast or whatever it is. And celebrate the Lord. Psalm 103, the previous one, celebrates God and His great mercy. We've talked about the great mercy and loving kindness of the Lord Psalm 104, where we are this morning, kind of goes hand in hand with the previous psalm. This psalm celebrates God and sings of the Lord's power and His majesty in His work of creation. And so this morning, by the grace of the Lord, as we look at this psalm together, we're going to kind of jump back and forth to Genesis chapter 1 and remind ourselves of what God did in his work of creation. Before we begin, let me remind you that when we talk about God as our creator, we're speaking of the Lord Jesus. The Bible is very clear. John chapter 1, verse 3, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Some of you were jumping over pins real quick, so let me go back and say that again, again, kind of maybe more slowly. John chapter 1. Verse 3, where we're reminded that through Jesus, all things were created by him, through him, for him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Paul echoes that sentiment that everything was created by Jesus for his glory and his will. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, reminds us also of that truth that Jesus is the one through whom God created the heavens and the earth. And so as we celebrate our creator this morning. Look at verse 1 in our psalm, and I want you to notice we will see God's greatness in creation. God's greatness not only in what he created, but in how he created. Look at verse 1, and if you will notice here in the free, these opening verses, we're really going to see day one of creation. In verse 1, the psalmist writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks in the, on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits. His ministers, a flame of fire. Notice in this psalm, we're not told the writer. His identity is a mystery to us. But you probably notice that the psalm begins similarly to Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The word bless is the word that describes kneeling before the Lord in praise in adoration. And remember that the word soul is what refers to us individually as both eternal beings in quality and also as unique individuals in personality. That's what our soul refers to. So in the previous Psalm, David begins by saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Here David is expressing his praise to the Lord and his desire that everything about him as a person, everything about him as a unique individual 
would praise and worship and honor the Lord. That was his desire. Shouldn't that be our desire too? Amen. Shouldn't we desire the same thing? Shouldn't that be our goal in life? Is that everything about us would be what brings praise and honor to the Lord. Shouldn't that be our pursuit in life? That it doesn't just happen on Sundays, but it happens every day of the week. Every situation, every detail, every place where we go. That should be our goal, our pursuit, our desire. Because when everything that is within you desires to praise the Lord, it seems that everything that's outside of you kind of follows along. It follows suit. Notice back in our psalm here, the psalmist continues, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he continues and says, O Lord, my God, you are very great. The word great is the word gadol. And what that word means is it literally means large. O Lord, you are very large. Large refers to God in several ways. It refers to God in the position that he occupies. It's a large position. It refers to God in the power that he possesses. He possesses large power. And this word refers to God in his praise, that he is worthy of large praise. God sits in the highest place of honor and majesty and authority, and he possesses infinite power that he chooses to use as he sees fit. And God is the only one who is worthy of praise and worship. So notice in verse 1, the psalmist describes God and his position. Lord, you are clothed with honor and majesty. You are clothed with honor. That word means beauty. Lord, you are clothed with beauty. We have no idea how beautiful the Lord is. Amen. The word clothed means to be arrayed and would describe your appearance, just like as we're all clothed with clothing today and it either enhances or draws attention to our appearance, our physical appearance. God is physically beautiful. He's described as light here. And that he's clothed with majesty, and that describes splendor. It describes a condition of excellence, that God is excellent. He is splendid. God is spirit. His outward appearance is one of beauty and excellence, and we can't describe it fully with our words. Our language is limited in describing the beauty and the majesty and the splendor of, of the Lord. Notice in verse 2, the psalmist continues, Who cover yourself with light as with a garment, like a master artist. God is light. The Bible tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness. And here, there, there the word light refers to what is holy, what is pure, what is what is true, and that describes who God is, that he is absolutely holy, he is absolutely true, he's absolutely pure. And, and light is always contrasted with darkness. So if light describes holiness, darkness would describe the absence of holiness, or we would say it would describe wickedness, it would describe evil. God is absolutely holy and true in who he is, and what he does and what he thinks and what he says. And notice in verse 2 that the psalmist not only describes God's position, but his power too. Look here. You cover yourself with light and you stretch out the heavens like a curtain. And we can think of the heavens like a curtain, like, like, like a mat that an artist would draw upon, like a, like a canvas. And God is like a master artist. He, he, he drew the heavens across and then began to, to draw, to create. He began to form and to fashion his work. This reminds us of day one in the Genesis account. Genesis 1 verse 1 begins, like most of us remember, in the beginning God 
created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was. And God looked at the light. He saw it and saw that it was good. God, who is light, he caused light to shine in the midst of darkness. And he brought form and order to all that had been shapeless and formless and chaotic. God did that on day one. Look at verse five, and I want you to notice here day two. The psalmist continues, verse five, you who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment, and the waters stood above the mountains. Here we see in verse 5 the word foundation, that God laid the foundation of the earth. A strong house is built upon a strong foundation. You know, the foundation is what's supposed to hold the house in place. So that way when the wind blows and the rain falls and the floods come up and all of this turmoil takes place is that the foundation will help the house to not move, to stand firm and fast. So we're reminded of what God did on day two of creation. In Genesis 1, verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And so God divided the waters under the firmament from those above, and God called the firmament heaven. Notice back in verse 5 that God laid the foundations of the earth. Literally what the psalmist is saying here is that God founded the earth upon her piers, upon her pillars. We see this a lot down at the beach, down in those coastal areas where homes are are not built upon a slab, but rather pilings are driven into the ground so that they go down deep into the ground and land upon a solid rock. And then the house is built on top of that solid pier, those solid pillars. Here we're reminded that God divides the waters and he set the earth upon her foundation, upon her piers. And not only did God lay the foundations of the earth, but we would be remiss if we went on and did not note that God has laid the foundation of our salvation. He has laid the foundation of our redemption, that the Lord Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith, and he is the foundation of our salvation. He is the pillars, the pilings, the piers that our salvation is based upon and built upon and that our salvation and our eternal life depend upon. We see God's greatness here. Let's move on quickly. Look at verse 7 and notice God's grandeur in creation. In verse 7, the psalmist writes, At your rebuke they fled, speaking of the waters. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. And by them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. Here we have a reference to what God did on day three of creation. Genesis chapter one, verse nine. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry ground appear. And so God called the dry ground earth and the gathering together of the waters. He called them the seas. Notice in in verse 7 here, the psalmist says that the waters fled. At your rebuke, they fled. When God rebuked the waters, they fled from the sound of his voice. You know, when we see storms come, when we watch the flood waters rise, it, it looks like water flows wherever it wants to go. 
but we're reminded here that God is the one who's in control. God is in control. God creates by the power of his word, and he controls what he creates by the authority of his word. And so all creation responds to God. All creation responds to the word of God, and they respond obediently in the fullness of obedience. Notice in verse 8, the waters went up over the mountains and down in the valleys to the place God founded for them. And then verse 9, the psalmist says, you've set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. You see, folks, it's God who sets the boundaries and the limits for the oceans and the seas and the rivers and the creeks and the streams. God is the one who tells the water and the waves how far they can come up upon the land. And so it's a waste of time to worry or argue about man-made climate change and how what we're doing is going to destroy the earth. Folks, God is in control of where the water goes. He's in control of how high the water comes. God is in charge, and we would be remiss if we did not consider that God is preserving his creation for a day of judgment. And when that day of judgment comes, it will not be with water. It will not be with a flood. It will be with fire and destruction. We also need to consider what else God did on the third day of creation. Genesis 1 verse 11, God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herbs that yield seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. God created the plants and he created them to be able to, produ to reproduce according to their kind. Folks, that's something that our culture's forgotten. Notice back in our text, verse 14, God causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The, hill, the high hills are for the wild goats, and the cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. God creates the grass and the flowers and the vegetables and the fruit trees, and he causes what he creates to, to grow and to reproduce. The deists believe something different. The deists believe that God does not intervene in what he's created. That God is not part of the day-to-day -day activities and events of creation. They, they describe the universe to a clock and God to a clockmaker. And what the deists believe is that the clockmaker, just like he makes the clock and he winds up the clock and then he watches the clock work, is they believe that God made the universe and then he wound it up and took his hands off of it and said, well, whatever happens, happens. That's pretty bleak, isn't it? But here the psalmist clearly explains that God is in control. He's in control of his universe. He's in control of his creation. And, and God is the one who watches and oversees every day in every detail to accomplish what he plans and what he purposes to do. God doesn't take his hand off of creation. His hand is clearly evident upon all that's happening, even around us whether we look at it and say, where are you, God? Or whether we look at it and say, I don't like what I see happening. God is in control. And what God chooses to do will ultimately be for his glory. And if we can look hard enough, it will ultimately be for our good as well. Look at verse 19, and here we see day four. God appointed the moon for seasons, the sun to know it's going down. You make darkness and it is night in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. And when the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. And man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Here we have day four, Genesis 1, verse 14. We read, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens 
to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for years. And so God made two great lights. Can you guess what they are? The greater light to rule the day, the sun. The lesser light, the moon to rule the night. And he also made the stars. We read here the psalmist talks about how God created light and these bodies here of light for seasons and days and times. God is the one who invented time. Did you know that? And God is the one who controls time. Now, God is timeless. He's not bounded by time. He's not held to your watch or your calendar or your mind or your thought. God has no beginning. He has no end. He's not ruled or restrained by time. But God has created time for his divine purpose. He established the 24-hour day. Some of you, when you were working, you wondered, boy, if we could just have a 36-hour day, I could get so much more done. That's not the way God designed it. He created a 24-hour day. Now that we get older, we think, boy, I wish this, maybe the day was shorter, huh? He created a 24-hour day. He created a 365 and one-quarter day year. God established that. God is the one who ordains the seasons. He determined the day of your birth, and he's already written down the day of your death. And everything in between, what you would call the dash on your tombstone, God has ordained that too. Every day, every detail, every event in your life, and God has set the day of judgment. No one can escape it. We cannot escape God's judgment. His greatness, his grandeur, Let's move along quickly. Look at verse 24. I want you to notice God's genius in creation. The psalmist simply breaks out in praise here. Oh, Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you've made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great, there the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you've made to play there. Here's day five in the creation account, Genesis 1, verse 20, where God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living thing and every winged bird. And notice in verse 25, the psalmist marvels at this. He marvels at the sea and the inhabitants of the sea. He describes it as this great and wide sea and all of the living things that are both small and great that live in the sea. Now remember, the psalmist is writing to and about a people that had not traveled the length of the oceans, that had not probed the, the depths of the oceans. Their understanding of the ocean and what lived in the ocean was limited but yet, he marvels. Boy, how much more we've come to be able to see and to experience and to know and understand about God's creation. Shouldn't we marvel all the more? But notice in verse 27, we see how God cares for what he's created. The fish, the reptiles, the, the birds. Verse 27, these all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. Here we're reminded that the animals trust God for their needs. God's faithful. God faithfully provides for his creatures. He gives them food in their due season. Right at the right time, he gives them exactly what they need. Folks, we can learn a lot from the animals. Have you ever watched the birds? I'm talking about the ones that have wings, not people that are a little strange. I'm talking about <laughs> the birds there. You ever paid attention to them? From, from dawn to dark, you watch these birds and they're hopping around and flying to and from and they're busily looking for something to eat. And God is the one who faithfully provides them with the seeds and the worms and the bugs and whatever it is that they feed upon. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, look at the birds 
of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And then Jesus reminds us, are you not of much more value to God than the birds even? Since God takes care of the birds and the fish and the animals, what can we know? What can we believe? God will take care of you. There's a good hymn that uses that. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. We can trust the Lord to take care of us, not only in our time of need, but also in our time of plenty. Verse 29, you hide your face and they're troubled. You take away their breath and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit and they are created and you renew the face of the earth. Here we see day six. And in day six, God created the mammals and the beasts. Genesis 1, 20, verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures, the cattle, the creeping things, and the beasts of the earth. And then day six culminates with the creation of mankind. Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our own image. And according to our likeness. And so the Lord formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being. You know, out of all of God's creatures, mankind is special. Out of all that God has created, mankind is unique. For you see, it's only man Mankind that God created in his image and according to his likeness. And it's only mankind that God chose to breathe into our nostrils the breath of life and has given us a soul, made us individuals, designed us to live forever and ever. Here the psalmist, look at verse 30, says, You send forth your spirit and they are created. Every person, male and female, by the way, it stops there. <laughs> Regardless of race and nationality and religion or family background, every person is valuable to God. And so since God finds us to be valuable to him, we should treat one another as valuable. We should treat one another with love and kindness and respect because we're all God's children created in the image of God. His greatness, his grandeur, his genius. Move along quickly. Look at verse 31. Notice God's glory in creation. We've already been through the six days of creation, so notice how the psalmist concludes here. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. When God finished his work of creation, the Bible says that God inspected it. He looked at all of it. In his conclusion, Genesis 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, indeed, it was very good. Not just good, very good. God was pleased with what he had done. But notice in this psalm here, the psalmist notes to us that that's not the end. He notes the entrance of sin and corruption into the world. Jump back to verse 23. In verse 23, the psalmist writes, Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. You see, from the very beginning, God created and designed us to work. But our work was originally not designed to be labor. Sin brought labor. Adam and Eve's work turned into labor when sin came into their lives and into the world. Weeds and thorns began to grow up in the garden. Adam and Eve, they began to toil and to sweat in order to produce the bread, the food that they needed in order to live. Look at verse 29. The psalmist writes, You hide your face and they're troubled, and you take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. Here we see the wages of sin. The wages of sin is what? It's death. That's what God's promise was, the day that you sin, you will die. The wages of sin, and ever since, 
Sin entered the world, death has reigned, beginning with Adam and Eve, working all its way down through all of the centuries and the millennia to our present day. And even before this day is done, thousands, if not even millions of people will die. That day that God wrote in his book, the day of their death, is today. Who knows? Today might be my day. Today might be your day. None of us know for sure. God is working for his glory. God is receiving glory and praise unto himself. Look at verse 33. The conclusion here, the psalmist says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. Are you glad in the Lord today? Amen. Notice that he says, I will be. This is a resolve. Sometimes being glad in the Lord is something that you resolve to do. Or in other words, your life could be a wreck. Your life could be a mess right now. Your life could feel or look like it's fallen apart. And everything about you says, I'm going to be angry today. But the psalmist says, I will be glad in the Lord. I will give thanks. I will be happy. I will be filled with the joy of the Lord in spite of what's happening in my life. Verse 35, may sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and praise the Lord. God is working toward a day when he is going to restore what we've destroyed. God is working toward a day when he is going to restore his creation back to that, it's that original, that sinless condition that it was created in. God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And we get a little picture of that in Revelation chapter 21. In verse 1, John writes, I saw a new heaven and I saw a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And then he goes on and writes this, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And Jesus has made all things to be new again. In this new creation that God's promised is coming, this new creation will be populated by a people who have been redeemed from their sin, a people who have been transformed into a condition of holiness and purity and righteousness and truth. Sinners will be judged and sentenced and Removed. They will be cast into the lake of fire where they will remain forever and forever to be separated from God and from his presence and from the presence of his people and from the presence of his creation. And here we see that the psalmist rejoices. Not in the death of sinners, he rejoices and praises God as he looks forward to what God's going to do, what God has promised he will do. And folks, what God promises he will do, he will certainly do it. God is faithful. He always does his word. He always keeps his promises. So as we think about creation and we think about how great is our God, how grand is he, what a genius he is, how glorious he is, and glory be unto his name. And we think about what is still yet to be created, a new heaven and a new earth. Are you part of the people of God? On that day of judgment, the day that God has already set in his calendar, a day which will never be changed. And by the way, there's a date in your calendar right now where you will stand before the Lord. On that day, you will not be able to call in sick. You will not be able to say, can we reschedule this meeting? This doesn't fit my agenda today. No, and that, that day is set. 
And when God calls, you'll respond. When God calls, we should respond. And so if God is calling to you today, take that as his invitation to trust him. And if you've never been born again, God's calling to your heart, would you take that as an invitation to trust and to be born again and to have your life changed and to have your future made sure and to know that heaven is your home and no one can change that, that you are forgiven and part of the family of God and Satan can't steal that. If you're not saved, if you've, your life has never been changed by by the Holy Spirit, if your sins have not been forgiven, would you trust Jesus to do that? And would you ask him to do it? The invitation is for all of us to hear and to repent. And that means to turn away from your current self and to turn to Jesus. And to not just be sorry because you were caught as a sinner, but to be sorry for what you've done to God and then to turn to him in resolution that by the grace and the power of God, I will not be that person again, that God will make me into a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. And the Bible promises that the old is gone and the new has come. And so as you think about and you look at your life, would you be able to go back to a, maybe a day, maybe a time, maybe a place Maybe a season where you remember that you were one person, but now you're a new creature. That would be evidence that you're born again and that you belong to God. But if you inspect your life and you don't see any change, would you consider that perhaps you're not born again, but today is the day of salvation. And today is the day for whosoever would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he or she would be saved. And so would you call upon the Lord while he's near? And would you trust him and ask him to do that work in your life? That's the invitation. Would you follow and trust Jesus today? And that invitation is for whosoever. And so let's pray together right now. With every head bowed here this morning, every eye closed, as we remember, we are in the presence of the creator. And God has made everything and he's made you. And just as God is intimately familiar with all of his creation, he knows you. He knows everything about you. Everything that you've done, he knows what's in your heart and your mind today, and he knows what's going to happen and what you're going to do tomorrow. And so it's pointless to try to hide from God. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. That didn't work too well. God found them, and he can find you. So if you hear and you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now, That's God calling out to you. Where are you? Where are you? God knows where you are. Do you know where you are? And would you respond? Would you listen? Would you hear? Would you respond to the cry of the Holy Spirit and his voice? And would you seek him while he can be found? Would you call upon the Lord while he is near? And Would you trust Jesus to forgive you and to save you? and to transform you and make you into a brand new person. That's what God wants to do, and he can do that to whosoever. And Lord, as we are still in your presence here this morning, and we remember that you are the creator. You are our heavenly father. You are the king. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You have made us, and you have made this day. And by your grace, you've given us this time and this opportunity to trust you, to call upon you while you're near to repent of our sin, and to turn to you, the only one who can save, and the only one who can forgive, and the only one who can make us into brand new people. And if there's one here who's not saved, I pray, oh Lord, give grace to be saved and faith to believe. For each one of us who are your children, oh Lord, give us grace to believe, faith to continue to trust and follow you. And lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake, that you would be honored and glorified in this place through the decisions that are made in each and every heart and life. And help us and give us courage to trust you and follow you. Even right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me if you need to.